checking over his shoulder to make sure he was still unseen, the assassin held his breath as he gently pushed on the heavy wooden door to the castle bedchamber and watched it gently swing open with only the faintest squeak from its hinges. Unsheathing the blade he had concealed in his tunic, the agent creeped over the threshold and entered the room, steeling his mind to the task at hand. His palms were sweaty around the grip of his weapon as he crept across the floorboards of the bedchamber and made his way through the dark towards the sleeping silhouette in the bed. The assassin was in the final phase of an intricate and perilous plot to eliminate the young duke. It was a dark task, for the duke was no more than a child, not yet ten years old, but it was a task that needed doing all the same. Normandy was a vast and powerful duchy. It could not be left to the rule of a child. Besides, there were powerful people with genuine claims on ownership over the duchy, and they were qualified, experienced adults. They were men who were not about to bow down to the rule of a child, and an illegitimate child at that. They needed the boy to die. The assassin had come so far and was now so close to completing his task. All he had to do now was kill the sleeping child. It would be a dark deed, but at least it would bring order to the land. It would bring peace and stability by putting someone with more experience at the helm. It would be one killing that could spare hundreds, perhaps thousands more. As the assassin approached the bed, he raised his weapon and prepared to strike at the sleeping figure. The only problem was, there was more than one. The room was dark, without any light save that from the window and the candle-lit hallway. In the dark, the two sleeping figures looked nearly identical, with nothing to tell them apart. Who was who? Which one of them was the child Duke? Which one of them was William the Bastard? In the year 1034, the Duke of Normandy, Robert the Magnificent, had decided he'd had enough of the endless fighting and management it took to run his lands smoothly, and he wanted to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. All his life, Robert had feuded with nearby lords and churchmen, including his own family, fighting and waging wars, all with the aim of growing and consolidating his power. It had been a violent and difficult life. A nice, relaxing vacation to the Holy Land was in order. Along the way, Robert could spend a year or two shedding the stress he'd saved up and in the end he could see Jerusalem and purge his souls of the many sins he had also saved up. His advisers warned him against it. Jerusalem was a far away place, they said, and the road to get there wasn't free of dangers. Besides, Normandy needed Robert. The wars and feuds he had spent his life fighting had weakened the land. Then there was the matter of Duke Robert's heir. His only son, William, was the bastard child of a commoner called Herleva. As far as noble pedigrees went, that was about as low as it got. What was more, William was only eight years old. If anything were to happen to Duke Robert, the Duchy of Normandy would fall into the hands of a bastard child. Duke Robert would hear none of it, however. Jerusalem may have been a far away place, and the dangers in getting there may have been numerous, but Robert was a brave man and a capable fighter. As for him needing to stabilize the realm, he trusted that to his faithful advisers. Lastly, regarding the matter of his heir, Robert was unconcerned. First of all, he was only thirty-four years old, so he fully anticipated on returning home. 
Secondly, bastard or not, William was still his son, and he would be his successor. With the matter of succession secured, Duke Robert was confident that his faithful counselors could manage the duchy in his absence, and he set off on his journey to the Holy Land. Little did he know he would never see his home, nor his son, ever again. Duke Robert made it to Jerusalem. He had seen the Holy Land. On his return journey, however, he fell suddenly ill while in the Byzantine city of Nicaea, and there he died. Back in northern France, the eight-year-old bastard son of a commoner was made Duke of Normandy. Thanks to his father declaring him heir, William had legitimacy, and thus support from powerful political figures of the time. Powerful figures like his great-uncle, the Archbishop of Rouen, and Alan, Duke of Brittany, as well as Henry I, King of France. There were also those closer to home that young William would have known well and been able to rely on. People like William Fitzosborne, who had been his father's steward, and Tyrold, his private tutor. In the immediate wake of Duke Robert's death and William's ascension as Duke of Normandy, the duchy was in a state of uncertainty. With the support of such powerful figures as the King of France and the Archbishop of Rouen, those who opposed the young duke could do little during this time save for watch and wait for their opportunity to strike. That opportunity would present itself in March of the year 1037, when the Archbishop of Rouen and William's primary guardian died. Without the stable hand of the Archbishop guiding things, the duchy fell into an almost immediate state of chaos. The young duke suddenly became the target for all those who wanted power for themselves, and fighting over him quickly erupted. Alan, Duke of Brittany, then became William's guardian. As cousin to William's father and the most powerful man of his father's council, Alan was trusted with the young duke's protection and tasked with the role of regent. Meanwhile, lawlessness and rebellion spread throughout the duchy. Seeking to put down a group of these rebels, Alan besieged a castle in the south of Normandy and there he suddenly died. William was then taken in by Gilbert, Count of Brion, a good and capable man who was also cousin to William's father. Sadly, however, only a few months later, Gilbert was murdered by two men while he was out on a morning ride. Then came Turchetel, a governor. He was murdered and William was then in the care of his private tutor, Tyrold, who suffered a similar fate soon thereafter, leaving the young Duke William under the care of William Fitzosborne, his father's steward. The young Duke William was a target wherever he went, as those seeking his power sought to hunt him down at any cost. Fitzosborne knew this, and he knew he must never let the young duke out of his sight. He guarded young William diligently, going so far as to sleep in the very same room as him. William's eyes shot open to the sounds of violence just beside him. In the darkness he could see nothing, though he could hear his guardian, Fitzosborne, struggling with at least one other man, shouting in combined tones of surprise and pain. Young William moved quickly from where he lay and made for the escape. He would have known what was happening. Behind him, a mortally wounded Fitzosborne struggled with the assassin, using his final moments to distract the killer while young William escaped. Fitzosborne would pay for his loyalty to the young duke with his life, later dying in that bedchamber, as Orderic Vitalis tells us, of a cut throat. The assassin escaped, 
only to later be hunted down by some of Fitzosborne's own men, come to balance the scales. The young Duke William lived in a world of peril and violence, the majority of it centered around him. Legends from this time in his life say that William's maternal uncle, Walter, would be forced to hide young William amongst the commoners to disguise him from those hunting him. As charming an image as this is, the young duke in the care of his mother's family of commoners, tanning hides and washing linens to blend in, the truth is a medieval duke could not simply hide during the time he was meant to be ruling his lands. Thus, William found himself unhappily in the care of yet another Norman nobleman, a man called Ralph de Gassy, or Ralph the Ass-Headed, a man whose reputation was as ugly as he was. William despised his new regent. He knew Ralph the Ass-Headed was involved in the plotting against him, and he may even have been one of the two men who had killed William's former guardian, Gilbert of Brion, when the latter had been out riding his horse. In any case, the young duke was now in his care and forced to hand over command of his military forces to his new regents to use as they saw fit. The young duke could have done nothing as he watched the men who had plotted against him now use his name his authority, and his army to satisfy their own desires. Still, William was no prisoner in a dungeon. He was a duke, and his regents needed him around so they could wield his authority as their own. It was then the year 1041 or 1042, and Ralph the Ass-Headed went off on campaign in Tillier, using the young duke William's soldiers as his own. It is in these years, growing up in his ducal court and guarded over by his regents, that William may have met some of the men who would go on to be his biggest supporters later in life. Men such as Roger de Beaumont, who would have been the oldest and wisest of the company. Roger of Montgomery, a capable and loyal young man who was due to inherit an important piece of land when his father died. And William Fitzosborne son of the other Fitzosborne, who had been assassinated in the young duke's bedchamber only a few years before. They would have just been young men or teenagers at the time, but the bonds of friendship and loyalty this group forged would go on to last the rest of their lives. Despite not being directly in power, William was no pushover, nor was he a fool. He was shrewd, cunning, and eager to throw off his so-called guardians. In these years he would have watched and studied, listened and learned, and as his teenage years came around, he began to exert his authority more and more over his guardians. William wasn't alone, either. Backing him, he had the wise Roger de Beaumont, the ambitious Roger of Montgomery, and the cunning William Fitzosborne the Younger. He also still had the powerful support from his neighboring Baldwin V of Flanders. With such friends backing him, William was able to push back against his regency, and in 1043 he began exercising his own authority. When a rebel viscount built and fortified an unlicensed castle near William's hometown of Falaise, the young duke, still in his minority, immediately gathered his troops and led them to Falaise. William of Jumiege, a monk, chronicler, and a contemporary of Duke William's, describes the scene thusly in his Deeds of the Dukes of the Normans. As soon as the duke heard the plans of this spiteful character, he summoned troops and swiftly made siege to him. Young Duke William arrived at Falaise and constructed a siege camp to starve out the settlement. The defenders did what little they could, but eventually their spirit died out as their hunger set in. 
Falaise surrendered to their rightful duke, earning young William the first of what would become many victories. By the year 1045, William had established enough power and authority in himself to declare an end to his minority. He shrugged off his so-called guardians and sent away his regents. Normandy was a land in crisis, a land in strife, conflict, and private wars. What was worse, there was a powerful and growing faction of nobles who opposed William's rule. The Duchy of Normandy was eating itself alive and nearing the point of collapse. It was time for the young duke to get to work. William began to purge his household, banishing those who had used and taken advantage of his power, and he rewarded those who had been useful or loyal to him during his tumultuous childhood. Men like Roger de Beaumont, Roger of Montgomery and William Fitzosborne climbed through the ranks with their duke, helping him to rid his household of those who would do him wrong. Duke William began calling in all those lords who had ignored him during the years of his minority, and, as one chronicler puts it, William began forcefully demanding the services owed by his own men. With the help of his new counselors, William was cleaning up the nobility. He had gathered together a brilliant and ambitious team of administrators, and they might have been the deciding factor in saving the Duke's immediate household. But they were still not enough to save the duchy from the growing faction that opposed the bastard Duke. Guy of Burgundy was one of the most influential of the lords in the faction opposing William, and ever since the young duke had inherited his throne, Guy had been a thorn in his side, spreading sedition, inciting rebellion, and telling anyone who would listen that it was he, Guy of Burgundy, who should be the Duke of Normandy. By the year 1046, Guy had enough power and support to launch a full-on rebellion against William himself. William had managed to survive the early years of his reign, though only just, now was his first official test as the acting Duke of Normandy, his first real battle against a formidable, perhaps even superior adversary. To make matters worse, William was caught off guard. According to a later Norman chronicler called Wace, while staying at Valogne in the west of Normandy, William was awoken in the night and warned of a plot on his life. Guy of Burgundy had mobilized his army of rebels, and they were at that very moment on their way to kill or capture the young duke. William's life was in immediate danger. Shocked and surprised, and perhaps remembering similar situations from his childhood, William tore away his blankets and ran to the stables, mounting his horse in the dark before galloping off into the night. William rode as fast as his horse would carry him, galloping down roads less traveled and avoiding local towns lest he was recognized by agents hunting him. Riding through the dark is a dangerous idea, but one that is far safer than being set upon by gangs of assassins. The countryside was not without its dangers either. William would have forded rivers and navigated through darkness. He rode until he reached the area around Bayeux, where he found a lord loyal to him who was willing to help. The lord's sons, armed and trained knights, joined William's retinue and escorted the young duke to his hometown of Falaise, where William began to grasp the true gravity of the situation unfolding around him. Guy of Burgundy's faction of opposition had seized half the duchy, and there would have been no way for William to summon an army to combat them. Raising soldiers took time and organization, two things William found himself woefully short of. Though he was safe in Falaise for the time being, Duke William was unprepared and powerless in the face of the enemy that now opposed him. Guy of Burgundy's faction had grown in size and in power, 
and now they had launched their opening attack in trying to assassinate William. Fortunately for William, they had failed. Unfortunately, it would only be a matter of time before they found him in Falaise. The situation looked grim, but there was one card the young duke had yet to play. In the winter of 1046-47, King Henry I of France received word that his vassal, the young Duke of Normandy, had come to his court seeking an audience. Henry had grown skeptical of William since the time he had blessed the child's succession to the Duchy of Normandy. Henry had hoped William might be more pliable in his childhood, a good little vassal who would do what he was told and keep his duchy in check. None of that had turned out to be true. But still, William was technically Henry's vassal, and Henry owed him the audience demanded. Duke William had come calling for aid, help in the civil war that Guy of Burgundy had launched against him. We don't know exactly what was said between the two men, though William likely reminded Henry that it was his sworn duty to protect his vassals. What sort of king would Henry be if he just stood by and let his duchy be usurped? William needed soldiers. He needed an army. King Henry I of France agreed. William returned to the half of Normandy still loyal to him and did what he could to prepare for war. With his lands so fractured, the number of soldiers he managed to gather together was rather small. Meanwhile, back in France, Henry called together his banners, summoned his army, and prepared for war. In the early summer of 1047, Duke William's forces met up with the army of King Henry I at Val de Dun near Caen. Guy of Burgundy and his faction, confident in their superior numbers and their cause, drew up their army to meet the enemy. A pitched battle between two standing armies was an anomaly for the time when sieges and raids were the primary modes of making war. Pitched battles were costly and uncertain, but they were decisive. Regardless of the winner, the battle between Duke William and the faction opposing him would end that day. The winner of this battle would also be the winner of Normandy. Normans were fearsome fighters throughout all of history. Their mastery and in innovations of war were unmatched in the region, leading to them becoming conquerors from England to Sicily, and some of the most sought-after mercenaries in all the medieval world. They were masters of the horse, fighting in ways we can hardly imagine today. A Norman war horse is a breed of horse that is extinct today, but one that was treasured by the knights who rode them into battle. The horses they bred for war were mean and tough, not meant for riding or idling. The men astride these stallions would have likewise been prepared for war, dressed in chain mail, guarded by a kite shield, and armed with a sword and lance. In a proper charge, the sound of medieval cavalry would have echoed into the sky, and the force of their hooves on earth would have shaken the ground. Dust would have kicked up as mean horses bred for fighting eagerly ran at a target they were bred to hate. The force of the charge could break any line of shields as lances skewered men and horses trampled them beneath their hooves. Next, the knights would have dropped their lances and drawn their swords, while their horses would have bucked, bit, and kicked at anyone foolish enough to get close. But even outside of a cavalry charge, a skilled knight on horseback was no easy target. They spent years of their lives working with horse and training for battle. They would not have simply hacked and slashed from side to side. Rather, they would have spurred their horse in a trained way to make it leap forward or skip 
side to side, than they would have cut with all their strength as well as the momentum of the war horse, cleaving their targets in two. The Normans were masters of war, and now they would face each other in open battle. Details of the Battle of Valley Doom are scarce, though what we do know is that the rebels were betrayed on the eve of battle when one of their own, Ralph Taylson, defected from the faction and brought his men over to Duke William's side. We also know that much of the battle was fought in cavalry skirmishes. Clusters of knights clashed against their rivals in a series of miniature battles fought over the course of a day. Wace the same chronicler who described William's flight into the dark on horseback, also describes the Battle of Valley Doom, though his account has to be regarded with some skepticism, considering that at the time he was writing, he was hoping to appeal to Norman audiences and William's own descendants. Regardless, he ascribes a great deal of bravery and prowess to young William, saying, Rushing in, he spread such terror by his slaughter that his enemies lost heart, and their arms weakened. After several hours of battle, the Allied forces of Duke William and King Henry I of France began to gain the upper hand. As the defenders realized this, they started to retreat. Retreat turned to panic, and soon the whole of Guy's army was in a rout, throwing down their weapons and running from the field as fast as they could. Wace goes on to tell us that those who fled were chased and cut down by the victors. Those who weren't cut down drowned when they tried to recross the Orne, weighed down by their armor or swept away in the current. Wace even goes on to tell how, further down the river Orne, Water mills came to a standstill and were choked up for days, so great was the number of bodies damming the river. William of Normandy, the bastard duke, had won the Battle of Valley Dune. He had crushed his enemies, killing some and scattering others to hide away in their castles. He had proven himself in battle and vindicated his right to the duchy. William had won Normandy and he was only nineteen years old. As for Guy of Burgundy, he managed to escape the Battle of Valédun, riding hard for his castle at Brion, where he barricaded himself with what little he had left and prepared for the worst. Duke William had just begun to consolidate his power, but the lessons he had learned in his early years would go on to mark his career moving forward. William had survived assassins, political scheming, attempted coups and battles, and he had learned from all of it. Moving forward, he would never shy away from using the full might of his power to crush rebellion and dissent. He would become a man obsessed with power and control. But all of that was far away in the future. In the meantime... There was still the matter of Guy of Burgundy, as well as a few other rebels who still needed to be hunted down. Duke William would have his duchy, and he would have his revenge. It had been a tumultuous decade, but William of Normandy had survived his childhood. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please consider leaving a like or subscribing, and thanks to those of you who already have. I'll see you in the next one.